Frank Gary, it's great to see you, uh, albeit virtually. Um, you and I met in person several years ago and have chatted several times, and I treasure your support uh, and your friendship uh, as, we, as we go forward at the school advancing USC. Um, we're here on the occasion of our annual reunion weekend uh, with our alumni, hundreds of alumni. Uh, USC Architecture has about 6,000 alumni globally. And uh, you have some USC alums working in your office, I believe, as well. And you really are singular amongst our alumni in your multidimensional architecture and design practice uh, that you founded, and also the, in the creative and philanthropic, philanthropic endeavors that you continue to be engaged in, uh, even at 90 years young. And so we'll try to get to uh, a conversation in these 45 minutes that um, deals with kind of where we are today, your early influence, uh, what you're most interested in now, and um, so I really look forward to it. I just want to start by asking, um, how are you and your family doing in this pandemic? And I know you're working between home and office, and how's everything going for you? We seem to be managing. Um, it's, uh, it's difficult. I go to the office for a few hours, a few times a week. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's nobody there usually. This we have a few model makers, and I sketch, and we do stuff online. Mm -hmm. But we have 170 people online, and we're trying to uh, maintain. We've so far maintained the staff. I don't know if how sure. depends how this election comes out. I guess. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. And your your family's doing well. Yes. Good. That's good. So you mentioned the election, and I don't want to go directly into that, but I wanted to ask you, um, with respect to the role of architecture, um, you and I um, are different ages, but I think we both are steeped in uh, and we're educated in the modernist tradition. And within that, there are uh, social ideals. And I wonder if you would speak about kind of how you see architecture's role today in terms of... Um, engaging in social issues and trying to advance social issues through architecture and design? Architecture, I believe, is an art. And so, uh, and I've always practiced it that way. And it's about curiosity and, and exploration of ideas and three and three dimensional with materials and blah, 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 uh, in the service of people. And so uh, the history has been that. And so I, I try to stay there. Um, my work at SC when I was a student, the art department was very close. We were in the same building. And I always try to manage uh, the relationship between taking classes on both sides and, and uh, maintaining relationships with the artists. So that's that part. The architecture is about building and uh, at SC, we had a great teacher, if anybody's around in this group that remembers him, Henry Burge, B-U-R-G-E. He taught pro practice. He was a great little guy. And I ran into him one day in, in the school on a quiet day. And he came up to me and said, Frank, um, you know, you're very talented and you're gonna be someone. He said, I want you to remember one thing. When you take a job or get it to work, no matter how small or how big it is, I want you to remember you got to do your best. Everything, every little thing, so that there's no residual uh, dropping the ball. You, you're going to take everything to the finish line and deliver for the client. And that, to me, was did not contravene being an artist. That to me was the same thing. So I maintain those two things. Henry Birch uh, is part of my life and uh, all the artists that I love and dearly are part of my life. Um, Can I take so, you for a moment back? So when you go to the social issues, I was gonna just finish that. Yeah. Question. When you go to the social issues, it's bringing that art to the social issues, which is um, 
uh, you don't have to eliminate the art. It doesn't just become uh, uh, cheaper buildings that have to be done for developers, say, that have to uh, uh, avoid the art part because if you mention the word art, in those, those situations, you'll probably get told, we can't afford that. <laughs> so the truth is they can, they do, and they did. Um, it is, uh, uh, so everything I've done has been to make my work more uh, relevant in the construction industry. And that's how I got involved with Desso Systems and uh, uh, their computer program and developed a, our own uh, use of it and still have a residual part, partnership in, in that company. Uh, the, the, uh, so you can do the art of architecture. You can make buildings that are, are humane and feeling and be, be built within developer parameters. So uh, with the computer, we've been able to do a tower with no change orders, 76 stories with no change orders. Wow. That's Harry Birch. That's, that's what I learned from him. You've got to figure out how to make it happen. And then you can deliver the, your whiz bang art, whatever it is, to the service of the client and the community and the world around you. And uh, then at difficult times for the world, if you have been successful, you can afford to donate your services and do stuff whenever you can for, for and I know a, a, most architects do that. Uh, we're, we're all very eager to be helpful as a profession, I think. Uh, that's always been the case, and I, I know it's, uh, it's all there. And you just uh, scratch an architect, tell them there's a social problem, and they jump in. <laughs> so that's a great thing about our profession. Does some of that come, Frank, from uh, you grew up in Toronto, you, you moved to L.A. with your family early on, uh, and you were... Uh, influenced by uh, that per period of time you were growing up in LA, in addition to the time you were at USC, could you talk about the role of Los Angeles in your intellectual and artistic development? Sure. Well, <clears throat> well, I was a truck driver for the first few years I was here. I didn't go, to, couldn't afford to go to school, but. I got to know LA pretty well, pretty good from driving a truck and delivering furniture and stuff. Um, and uh, I saw the industrial buildings out the east, side, east side of LA with the um, concrete plants and the uh, whatever they were doing. Um, and I was fascinated by them. The architecture prevalent in the, in the uh, were tract houses. They were building millions of tract houses out there with wood frame. And the first architecture classes at SC were, uh, uh, Gordon Drake had died, but it, it was his influence. And there were a number of, I probably can't remember names of them, but Harold Harris was an architect practicing in East LA, and uh, then there was Lautner, and and so there. But the the influence on the West Coast of the United States was mostly Asia centric, and that that brought a lot of um, uh, inter interesting young architects who came out of the war as GIs and, and uh, saw Issei Shrine and, and uh, Katsura Palace and all of the Japanese buildings that were built with 
smaller wood pieces. And lo and behold, they had that um, uh, kind of, of uh, craft going on here, easily transferable into uh, a pseudo Japanese aesthetic. Mm -hmm. And uh, Gordon Drake did it, and Cal Straub was teaching at SC, and he was uh, very much a part of it. And they were showing students how to build uh, tract houses, but very Jap Jap Asia centric and uh, green and green with their uh, roofs and the, and the, uh, the uh, that roofing material. I forget what it's called. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just a, a tar with stones on the surface. Right. I forget, it's, there's yeah. a name. Anyway, uh, so if you go up Cold, Cold Water Canyon, or, or no, no, um, Benedict Canyon, the, halfway up there's a street, and you turn right, and there's the Harwell Hamilton Harris house mm -hmm. that knocked my socks off. And uh, so we were, that's what we were doing. I can show you the early stuff. And so, very Asia centric, and I got involved with uh, UCLA had a ethnomusicology department, and they were they had a Japanese orchestra based on the uh, gagaku, the uh, court court musicians from the Imperial Palace, and there's a, a teacher that I met who put me in the orchestra, and I I wasn't a musician, but <laughs> there was a, a frame hung with a thing that looked like a frying pan and it was given two mallets and the sound went clink clink and I had to learn to do the clink clink and they sent a guy from Japan who spent hours teaching me how to breathe so I did the clink clink right uh, so it, it was the more you got into Asian uh, and, and Korean and Chinese and the whole thing. It was so rich and so accessible at, at that time. So we had those two things going. You had the, uh, this industrial, very tough uh, factory kind of stuff on uh, that was very exciting. And you had the Japanese uh, uh, Asia centric kind of environment. Those two, a student coming mm -hmm. out of school could, could uh, find a lot of inspiration in those two uh, mm -hmm. areas. Bringing it to today, um, obviously you went through tremendous um, transformation, acceleration in your career, uh, coming towards Disney Hall, and now coming to uh, full circle, the Grand Avenue development across from Disney Hall, which which had been contemplated for a long time. Um, what are your thoughts today on where Los Angeles is as an urban metropolis, um, where it needs to go, and how how your pieces of the puzzle are kind of helping LA, particularly downtown, to arrive at a at a certain kind of urbanity that um, that maybe it, it has lacked. Boy, I don't know if we're winning that one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, there's a lot of water under that bridge. Um, I, I, it was a miracle I was chosen for Disney Hall, I think. Uh, I happen to have been very involved with the, with the remodeling of the Hollywood Bowl, and I think that's what started my work with the LA Phil. Um, uh, the Grand Avenue looked like it should be a cultural street. It had the Chandler, it had the, the uh, Amundsen and the theater. And then Gordon Davidson was, was the head of it. And he had a little office down in the corner of Temple and, and uh, Grand. And 
there were a few people on the uh, board of the LA Phil who were kind of interested in, in creating a downtown, like Eli Broad was one of them, mm -hmm. who tried very hard to uh, make this the center of culture and, and, and pushed for Disney Hall and, uh, and then his own building. Uh, and then he was also instrumental, I think, in my getting the, the project to do across the road, the commercial project with, mm -hmm. with Related. Now, you know, the, this is harder, a commercial project for me at that time, although I'd worked with Gruens and I knew how to do it, it's much more difficult to turn that into uh, my highest aspirations. <laughs> <laughs> Why so, is that? Well, it's just, uh, you can't get the kind of relationship with that client that you do with, you know, with Disney Hall, I got involved with the music. I met mm -hmm. the, the musicians, the conductors. We, we could talk it through. We could uh, organize ourselves and, and talk about our values and so on. Mm -hmm. Developer doesn't come in like that. So even the computer stuff that I was bringing to the table, they weren't interested because they do it their way. You know, it, it was all different. So uh, we did pretty well, I think, with it. But it, it's um, it's it's different. Um, I think that the Disney Hall became very successful. Uh, the architecture helped was soon turned out was a plus for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I've stayed involved. I'm on the board of the LA Phil. And that's how I got into the philanthropy part, working with Gustavo Dudamel, because he comes from Venezuela, from a thing called Sistema, where they bring four year olds into studying music. And they, right now they have uh, close to a million kids, even under the dictator, learning music in the schools from four years on. And all of them are treated equally. So it's a, uh, the first few times I went there and experienced it, I, it brought tears to my eyes to see how this, this could happen. What cities and, were you in, Caracas? Caracas and and Barquisimeto, which is on the east eastern western mm -hmm. side. That's where Gustavo's from. And so I went four times with Gustavo. I met the kids, spent time with them, spent time with Maestro Abreu, who designed the whole system. And now Gustavo's in L.A. Abreu passed on. Gustavo has started a thing called Yola Youth Orchestra LA. And we're just completing a building in Inglewood for that uh, venue, which I didn't design. I, uh, it's a bank building that they remodeled. All I did was interfere and made it, the ceilings higher so they could uh, have a real uh, concert hall experience with the kids. That's right. Uh, but the second one is going to be in Southgate, and we're working along the river, and Yola will be there, and we're bringing uh, L.A. County Museum and uh, Benjamin Milkey with dance and uh, ceramics and all the other components of art and music, and we're creating a, a street, a beautiful street that these simple uh, buildings that are more in the spirit of the first house I did on 22nd Street, to the very inexpensive, but still uh, rise to some occasion of aesthetic, hopefully. And uh, uh, that is in process now. We're, and that's about social justice. And I think it's, we're desperately in need of those kind of projects. And I'm able to spend my own time, uh, donate my own personal time to, to that one. What are your thoughts on um, where we find ourselves? Um, you've been, um, you've traveled 
uh, Venezuela. You've, you've got projects all over the world. You're obviously do research before you go into some of these projects and geographies and different demographics. Um, we're sitting here within the United States at a time where um, we're reckoning with um, a lot of issues around social justice and racial justice. And yes. what are your perspectives, uh, hopefully optimistic ones, uh, relative to those who are in architecture and want to make, want to make um, social change and they want to do it through great design and, and great advocacy and great philanthropy like you? Um, I, think, I think they have to dig in and yeah. make it happen. Uh, I'm happy to talk to anybody, uh, offer my advice, but I, I'm not the only person. There's lots of, you know, once you open that door, there are lots of archi architects tend to be optimistic and, and uh, interested from, as I said before, from the beginning. So it's a profession that's interested. It's just that we're racially unbalanced. We don't have a, a re high representation of black architects, even though we've tried. Uh, it's it's just there aren't graduate. They're not graduating as as much. We got to change that. Uh, we're, we're our office has forty percent women, uh, maybe a little higher, and that was easier to do. But the the racial thing is harder. And we got we can't give up. We got to keep at it. Make sure it, it goes happens, and uh, offer our services when we can to social justice issues. And so uh, there's plenty of stuff to design. There's going to be prisons that got to be rethought completely. And you did a studio at, at Yale and SciArc on prisons. Yeah, yes. What did you and learn from those those studios? Well, you meet the people that are incarcerated, and it's scary, you know. Uh, women, I had a round table with about 20 women who were so-called lifers, and, and their stories were all similar. They got beaten up by a guy or something, you know, and they shot him. <laughs> um, but... Uh, I think there's hope. There's uh, Susan Burton came out of that. She started a facility that in Watts that uh, has homes. They buy a home and they outfit the bedrooms for for uh, people coming out of prison so they can uh, re-enter the lifestyle. She she has people helping them, and training them, and helping them back into the the world. Uh, there's a lot of places to work. There's a lot of people. I mean, just look at um, what's the name of the guy I met at Oxford? Um, huh? Brian. Brian Stevenson. Yeah, amazing. He's an amazing guy. I met him uh, a few years ago at Oxford University, and he is. Uh, he's a lightning rod. He's just amazing. So there's there's plenty of people out there to talk to and connect to, and we'll show you where to go. And um, we've got to re-educate the developers that are going to be building this these this world, these worlds, and show them how our technology and our professionalism can meet their budgets and eliminate the waste that they just put up with and say that the money they recoup from that waste, they can pay a little extra for the architectural fees <laughs> and get it right. <laughs> and I think that's true. And I think once they understand it, but it's a learning experience and teaching experience. The younger, we have a young development group that we're working with that kind of understand it. So there's a, I see some glimmers of hope out there. Mm -hmm. But um, I would say graduating architecture, you should find out who these young developers are and start to look at them and see, see who's interesting, who might be intellectually engaged if you 
mm -hmm. get to know them. Uh, because it's to their benefit. If you do a great building, man, they make out like, like mad. And, and uh, it's been proven over and over again. This, the funny little museum in Bilbao was built for $100 million. And that was the budget. We were right on budget. Nobody knew that. And it has raised north of 8 billion euros since it opened for the community. I'm not surprised. I was there um, about two years ago. Uh, it's really an exceptional building. And um, I, think, I think you're right. Culture is underestimated as a generator of wealth and, and economic um, activity. Well, they, they accept it in the movies. They accept it in the music world. But somehow, that's why we got to make sure let them know this is an art. This isn't just uh, technograms or something. It's <laughs> the real thing. <laughs> you and think that's, that, uh, that's what delivers the value. The art of architecture delivers the value. <laughs> that's a great uh, mantra, and I think it's true. And I wonder, um, just to, to kind of talk about where we are at USC Architecture today versus when you were here, and maybe how... <clears throat> Some of these things are um, now being weaved into the education. First of all, we, we are 60%, about 60% female across our undergraduate and graduate students. We're 20, over 20% 20 of our undergraduates are Latinx, uh, over 20% are Pell eligible, and over 20% are first in their families to go to college, uh, with about 6% black American students. Um, Climate is a big topic and is of big interest to, to all of our, to most of our students, uh, no matter where they come from. We have international students as well. And I wonder, um, in the context of about, Frank, 60, maybe 60% 60 of our students will go into what we would think about as a traditional architectural practice, but about 30 to 40%, and this is consistent, I think, across the country, amongst our peer institutions, 30 to 40% of students who go through architecture programs will not go into traditional practice. And these may be the future developers. These may be the future city council people, um, people who are spread across the design build industry. Um, and, and maybe we can, we can help them uh, have a different consciousness about how they navigate uh, architects, uh, and the design build industry in a way that, that might be more um, open you up a more gotta, progressive you gotta, way. Than, you've got to train them that this is bring, what brings the value. And yeah. you can, that's what will change people's minds. If you can bring a, a management of a building so that the change orders are cut way back, so there's not a lot of waste like there is now. Mm -hmm. And the waste there is now is accepted by developers. They just factor that in. They say that's the, the cost of doing business. Well, screw that. The cost, <laughs> they can put that 15% into the architecture and, and pay the 3% of it to the architect, a little extra, and the rest of it make it just a little bit friendlier. I think the difference between a, a, a nothing building and a work of art is 15%, period. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> and you can prove it. You can prove it. <laughs> so, do you, do you think that, because um, you, this, you're, there's two kind of angles that you're, that I hear you come in at this uh, from. One is um, the qualitative aspect of the role of aesthetics and the artistic craft of the architect in making space meaningful. Uh, making space and form meaningful. The other perspective is the technical ingenuity to to make that happen in a very efficient way. And I think climate is will press the building industry and developers to be a lot more efficient and 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 to care for that waste that you're talking about. You developed Gary Technologies, which was um, so influential in the field when you created it. It was um, it was a game changer. And I think I think you you emblematize kind of these two positions of the craft uh, and the ability to kind of bring the technical aspect to it. 
you know when when there was a time when uh, people like you and and Tom Main and others uh, were thought that you know these designs are so so outlandish that they're going to be expensive. You're going to be the expensive architect. When in fact, you you actually pivot, and several of your uh, colleagues pivoted really to making the case that that the art the artistic uh, uh, vision can be made to be an efficient vision. And I think that's compelling uh, a compelling case to make as you as you talk. The building of Disney Hall was fraught with all kinds of experts, including the contractor who was the most important contractor in LA, knew better than me how to build a building. His advice wasted $80 million on the first <laughs> go around. I got blamed for it. Right. Actually, the budget on the second go around, the building was $207 million. Our office built the Walt Disney Concert Hall for $207 million, okay? And I got a letter from the county telling me that was true. The only thing that's wrong with that is our fees were shy about $7 million because just that just didn't get factored in. So when a building was done, some nice people on the board put our name at the top of the donors list. So I'm even above Eli Bro. <laughs> I don't know whether that's good or bad. <laughs> well, it's, it's a good, it's a real story. It really happened. Yeah. And it just shows you how the, these boards and people and the construction people are so, uh, you know, they're mind blocked by all that's gone on and what they believe in. And they all know, think they know everything, and they don't. I, that's why you, the architect has to become Papa Song. You have to take responsibility and really do it. And that's what we've tried to do. And I think it pays off. Pays well, off for uh, paid off for us, and pays off for the client. Yeah. And and uh, pays off for the community. And I think there's a lot better stuff can come out if people would grab that that lever and go with it a little more, not be afraid. And, you know, when I started, I worked for Victor Gruen. Uh, Gruen was a commercial architect, right? But they, they were at the forefront of thinking about cities and Victor was just mesmerizing. And, and uh, I mean, it didn't go great as architecture, but it did, uh, it, it it, it opened a lot of, of venues. So I, I grew up in Fresno, as you might know, and I remember uh, as a kid walking through the uh, pedestrian Fulton Mall, the outdoor mall that Gruen designed in Fresno, one of the early versions of that. There were people uh, way back then that were open, like like Lautner, and, and uh, he really tried and did so many great things. I want to ask you about um, working on university campuses. Um, oy you've done a lot of buildings on, what's that? <laughs> I said, oy vey. <laughs> you've done a lot of buildings, MIT, uh, just a number of really great buildings on, uh, on campuses across the country. And uh, I'm sitting here in South, our South, USC South Park campus. Uh, I'd love to be sitting in a Frank Gehry building, but I wonder how, um, how you think about, do you think about campus architecture differently? Because these are like cities. It's an aggregation of buildings that are built in all different different times. And I'm wondering, um, you know, what kind of perspective do you bring to campus architecture that may be different from your commercial or cultural projects? Well, it's, it's, it's not different. It's a problem to solve and it has a different, uh, we did a building at Princeton um, I think I'm sure we did. Yes, <laughs> you did. <laughs> yes, <laughs> uh, an undergraduate building. Um, I think uh, it's like working with a developer. You know, the, the university has all these funny people running things uh, that are complicated. 
they they feel uh, 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 emboldened to push an architect around a little more. It's like the like doing work for the the government in uh, Washington. Uh, I think uh, there's so many regs and things that makes it really difficult. But I think you're building spaces for learning. You're building spaces for people. You're building outdoor spaces. It's uh, it's beautiful. It should be easy. Uh, uh, it should be inspiring. Uh, I think it's a real. It's a real opportunity. I I, I only got one to do. Maybe I did one. In oh, I did one. In, I did one in in um, Australia, the business school. That that one came out fun. That was a lot of fun. In, in L.A., um, when I think about um, Grand Avenue and what's happening there, and I think about particularly Figueroa as a kind of linkage between USC and downtown, um, I, 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 I think it would be interesting to, to think about how to, how to connect um, what's a huge campus here in South Park to the, the life of downtown Los Angeles. And... Um, but the buildings, the SC built, that, yeah. the buildings SC built reaching out into that venue aren't the greatest. Right. Well, I wonder if you if found... Somebody it. hasn't already told you that. <laughs> well, but I wonder if you, if you, if you fantasized about, um, about doing um, projects um, in or near uh, one of the USC campuses and how, how a project could, could link um, campuses, which tend to be enclosed to a larger kind of ur urbanity. Yeah, you know, I, I don't get down there. I When I went to school, it was pretty detached from all that. It was, uh, I, don't, I don't remember. So right now, urbanity is coming south toward the school, right? And right. Then, now you're building that uh, uh, museum for what's his name, Star Wars guy. Uh, that's Expo Park, yeah, Exposition Park, the Lucas Museum. And, uh, and our aerospace museum, the guy who's the director of the aerospace museum, has wanted to tear it down since before before it got completed when it was new. So and he's still there. So that's the level of your ex your <laughs> administrative <laughs> people toward architecture. <laughs> well, you've met you've met our president, uh, new president Carol Fult, and I think um, uh, you know. We well, let's hope she can. She has the time. She's got to <laughs> solve a lot of other problems too. Exactly. Uh, but, yes, uh, I was I was really impressed with her, and uh, I'm happy about your being there. So. There's two four. <laughs> <laughs> Let's find something to work on. I think I think there's some creative. You might things. have to kick a few people off your board. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a couple of questions from students that I want to bring in here um, that I think will be interesting to you. Um, Kevin Bass, who's a Master of Architecture student in his second year from San Diego, asks. What is an architect's number one responsibility? To be a good listener, to understand the task that he or she is being uh, assigned and, and taking responsibility for. And as Henry Burge told me, no matter how small, you deliver it. You deliver it on time and on budget, and with with as much beauty as you can muster. Very good answer. Um, Katie Hayes, a Bachelor of Architecture, fifth year student from Massapequa, New York, asks, "How would you define the difference between sculpture and architecture?" I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
obviously a sculpture uh, per se, you look at it and it's, it brings beauty to a place and it brings ideas of beauty, like uh, the recent movie uh, on PBS the other night showing the Bob Irwin room that he did in, in, um, in um, where's that place in, that uh, Don Judd's place, Marfa, in Marfa. Uh. Just look up that and you'll see, mm -hmm. see what Irwin did. He's an amazing piece of work. Um, that's inspirational. That does things to your uh, head and your body and your and makes you think. Uh, architecture has to do that too, but it has to also have a bathroom and it also has to have uh, a door to lock at night and it also has to have windows and it also has to have a lot of things that a sculpture doesn't have to have but this the i've been inspired by a lot of artists including erwin over the years uh in my work and uh i've i've valued that those relationships I grew up with, they became very personal to me and, and uh, uh, they're mutual. We, we talk to, have talked to each other. So it's, I, I think they're not mutually exclusive. You know, they're, we should, I mean, Borromini, Bernini, you've got all the examples of people who did it both, both and, and uh, don't be afraid to try it. Um, what what do you person? Gonna ask you what 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 you personally get out of the kind of design projects that you get involved in that seem very um, bespoke, like the Hennessy um, cognac uh, bottle design, the jewelry that you've done for Tiffany's. Um, how do you decide which projects to take on, and and what do you get out of those projects, except what looks like having a lot of fun? Um. Well, I, uh, Tiffany's a long time ago, and uh, I kind of liked the idea. It was small stuff, and uh, I was able to play with some pretty interesting craftsmen. I got hooked once I went to the craft studios and met with the people that make the work, and uh, I got excited about how they... They worked and and uh, uh, they offered to collaborate with me. So, uh, of course, we had the business of the Tiffany Company directing. With, so we made a lot of stuff that never got built, but um, that was fun. It was it helped uh, pay the rent a little bit when we needed it way back. Uh, the, the stuff with, uh, with uh, LVMH, with Arnaud, was different. I designed their museum. We became uh, good partners. Uh, they asked me to do uh, some, some buildings for the Cognac brand that are kind of exciting, but got put on hold during this mm -hmm. epidemic stuff. So. And so as part of that, it was logical to do a bottle to go with that building. So that's why that was done. Um, and I enjoy working with Mr. Arnaud as a genius uh, in many ways. He's a concert pianist as well, classical musician. And I, I listen to him play the piano a lot. Uh, he's... Uh, his, his interests are so far ranging, I, you can't keep up with him. And it's, it's not heavy handed. It's very, always very, uh, but Franck, would you look at this for me for a moment, please? <laughs> and it was kind of like that. It's not, it's sweet and wonderful and it's treated like that. And so 
it's kind of like I'm playing tic-tac-toe with the genius. Mm -hmm. Kind of. So I, I enjoy it for that reason. I never know where he's going to go. And I like the improv that improbability of it. Uh, Are there upcoming collaborations you're particularly excited about with, with him or others? That you... Yeah, well, this little building in Cognac, if it goes ahead, I'm really excited about. But mm -hmm. it's a new kind of glass thing we're doing. Um, what else, maybe? We're busy. We have work from before COVID started, so that is under underway. So a lot of it's in uh, just in construction, starting. Um, and there's some new things, not not a lot. Has 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 the pandemic <clears throat> changed the way that your uh, or your firm are uh, looking at different projects that were in queue before the pandemic? Well, we don't get this personal uh, interaction like we had, you know, where you can have a meeting and then open a bottle of wine. And <laughs> <laughs> or cognac. <laughs> or cognac. Uh, you, think, you think people will flock back to offices, for example? I think we learned something about off-campus working with that's going to be very valuable for staff, uh, especially for women that are going to have families. So they're going to have kids. And it's very difficult for an architect to create a nursery because the liabilities, I've looked into it, and the liabilities are horrendous for somebody like us to take on. Mm -hmm. So having the ability to let them work online from home for half a day or uh, three, day, two, three days a week probably is going to work. Anyway, it's, it's kind of uh, brings a new idea, a new uh, opportunity for the way we practice. I don't think uh, the whole thing can be done that way, like we're trying to do now. It's very frustrating. We get our signals mixed i forget something <laughs> uh, one is one person gets it out of the message another way and, and you, you're not interacting daily so you're not catching the the discrepancies at the time you know immediately you mm -hmm. you get everything so there's a little bit of i mean but it is something we learned and i think people are going to um work on make that work in the future and that's going to be great for uh families uh professionals it's going to make everything a lot better for, for, for uh, young families mm -hmm. now all we got to do is figure out a way to get uh their the tuitions reduced and paid for that's a big deal when i didn't realize how big a deal i mean my unit count at, at SC was, I, I forget it was, $1,200 a unit or something. <laughs> college is, college is yeah. becoming, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's expensive. And it's, it's um, of course, we are, we're trying to educate about 700 students on, we are educating about 700 students completely online right now. Um, so it's we're we're learning uh, just as you are, and interested to learn what you're learning. I'm sure um, you're interested to see what what we've learned. And obviously, these are going to be people who are going to be future practitioners, our students. Yeah. Um, so we've been able to create some scholarship funds at Yale, where I that's where I teach. So, um, and they're they've been helpful. But anyway, well, one thing that. Um, We've talked about your uh, philanthropy with Turnaround Arts, Yola, and uh, the Colburn School as well. I think you're you're a great um, asset and also an, an example to others to to get involved and get engaged. A um, couple of last questions. One is um, from a student as well around fame, and the question from Calder Scarp. <laughs> I, I don't, Calder Scarpa, uh, 
Bachelor of Architecture second year uh, from Venice says, at what moment in your career did you start to get notoriety and how did the fame affect your work daily practice or did it affect you at all? Oh, God. Well, it's something, I mean, you can't, you can't be honest and say that you didn't, you don't, you don't like it. I, I mean, that would be dishonest. <laughs> Everybody loves attention. Um, especially when you're starting out, nobody gives you any attention <laughs> for so long that when somebody says something nice, <laughs> wow, I didn't know that could happen. Um, I start every job as though it's uh, like the first time. I don't, I don't ride on that. I don't presume anything. Uh, I, I hope you can see it in the work that, that it doesn't presume anything. It, it takes its own risks at the time and goes with the flow. And, and my standards are high, but I have a certain amount of trepidation and fear always, uncertainty, which I think is healthy. Uh, I don't presume something's finished just because everybody, if somebody says they like it, I, that, it doesn't matter until I like it myself, until I, because I've got too many criteria in my little head that I've been taught all these years that nobody else can possibly have that are the criteria that make me decide what I'm doing and what it, whether it's relevant. Uh, and so I, and I have a, you know, I can explain what I'm trying to do, but it's, it's, it's always more than what I explain because there's a lot of feelings that go with the thing. So that level, I call it a healthy insecurity. And I think that's true. I feel I'm, uh, most, most of my friends who are beyond belief, the greatest artist, the greatest musician, the greatest everything, have that same feeling. You know, if I talk to one of the greatest conductors in the world, Esapeka Solomon, and he's a composer and conductor, he is so modest, he can't even, you couldn't have a lot of this discussion with him. <laughs> and, and he's, you know, he's a genius and we all know it. And so it doesn't matter. I think that's, that's good, that's separate, that's part of something else. And other people decide that, and sometimes it's good, and sometimes it's irrelevant, and sometimes it's it is it isn't. But um, the, I don't live on that. The important thing is uh, taking care of my family, taking care of the people that work with me, making sure the clients get what they pay for, and make sure that it's a good neighbor in the community. And I take great pains to make the buildings a member of the community. So I pay attention to the neighbors. Uh, and, and uh, if, you know, you can see that, I think, but uh, that's what I'm trying to do. I think that's great advice to our alumni. It's great advice to students. And I think, um, you may have heard we, since I came, we've we've talked about um, what we are doing at the school is educating citizen architects, um, having many of the aspiring to having many of the qualities that you're uh, that you're talking about and implementize as well and symbolize. And so I think that all of those are extremely important in terms of uh, how we think about architecture today and how we think about the role of the architect. Um, on behalf of the school, I just it's it's a great honor to to speak with you and to have the opportunity to to talk about um, where you are and, and where you see the field and the culture that we're in from your perspective from your unique vantage point and perspective. We all respect the work, uh, but we also respect you as an individual and all the things that you've done for the discipline and all the things you continue to do and. We look forward to continuing to dialogue with you and um, connect with you. Uh, you are, again, I think singular amongst our alumni in terms of the very unique career uh, that you've had and continue to have. So 
I certainly personally appreciate it. Can I get a free parking space when I come? Sure. <laughs> can I can I get a bottle of of uh, the cognac? <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> but we love to uh, we love to continue to connect with you. I think uh, uh, it's great that you know we're in LA. We we've got to see each other uh, at some point. Hopefully, we'll get out of this situation. But uh, I look forward to to getting together with you.